Reading Kani, an African Prophecy by Dr. Blanchard Onanganjila. One of Okaran Kenny's eldest brothers was respected among family members because he was a war hero. On behalf of his country, he participated alongside other nations in the First Indochina War. Okaran Kenny's brother took part in a war that ended up with the troops under his authority winning. Upon returning home to Bukandis, it was respectably feared by almost everyone who knew him. The government of his country lightly honored his service, as well as the sacrifice he made to solidify his country's ties to the superpowers he fought alongside with. As a war hero nationally and enthusiastically celebrated by the people of his tribe, he became their pride as well. Kalibi, which means bravery, was Okarankani's war hero brother. He was a tall, handsome, good-looking soldier who put a certain pride into the type of clothes he would wear. He was very strict and unapologetically against treating children as if they were breakable china. Indeed, Kalibi had on numerous occasions publicly disapproved other way his sister and brother-in-law were raising their children. He would contend that both parents were too weakly soft, therefore they were not properly disciplining their children. As the soldier he was, that meant spanking, canning, and hitting them hard if need be, so they would learn not to repeat the stupid act that got them in trouble in the first place. Kalibi's strong disapproval of his sister and brother-in-law's way of raising their children was a pretext hiding a very long-standing, profound hatred and old rivalry between brothers-in-law. Upon the passing of Kalibi's father, he became the head of the Alilai's tribe's council almost the same way and about the same period that Kenny became the head of Atejville's council. Both brothers-in-law were powerful leaders, highly respected among the respective communities and peoples. The real beef between these brothers-in-law had to do with Kalibi having trouble accepting Kenny as his brother-in-law. He had never approved or believed that the latter was worthy of his sister. He held a grunge against Kenny because the latter never paid a dowry to his in-laws. Kalibi considered this act a deliberate, disrespectful way of spitting on his family's name and reputation, even though before his death, Chief Bakura, Kalibi's father, had purposely given his consent for his daughter to be married without her husband having to pay for any dowry. A dowry could be of many forms and shapes, and it symbolizes a way to unify a husband to his wife. Generally, the husband paid money according to the number of children the couple had, as well as the number of years spent with the future bride. The longer the couple had been together, the larger the amount of money would be. That money once given to the future bride's family, would generally be distributed by the eldest member of the family. The dowry was also a way to compensate and appreciate the bride's family for having done such an excellent job raising her. It was, in the final analysis, a source of money, joy, pride, respect, and honor. I'm now going to read a, a portion of uh, chapter 9, entitled The Closing. The chief of the village took the floor and introduced the issue at hand. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, I salute all of you for attending this important meeting. I must say, I'm glad everyone is here. I can indeed see boys and girls, 
young men and women, adult men and women, and the elders. Before I go further, I need to remind all of us that the floor will be given first to our dear uncle, brother, father, nephew, and son, Kani, who has returned from the capital city after having spent almost 40 years there. After him, I will give the floor to whoever wants to voice their opinion on the issue at hand. While still speaking, the chief stopped as if he needed some breath to keep going. Then he alluded to the reason why there was the gathering. We are here under this speaking tree to discuss an important issue. The issue is about the land. As underscored a while ago, Kanu went to the capital city for a long period and left his ancestral lands with his ailing uncle, Hope, his last family member residing with us. We, at Tedgeville's leadership, believe that upon Hope's passing, the land should be sold or given away to needy families. Kanu's family holds no titles to the lands. Therefore, we want to take those lands away from Kani because upon Hope's passing, they will unquestionably be vacant. This is the issue we are here to grapple with, people of Atejville. Once again, the chief abruptly stopped talking. He resumed speaking after a brief pause. That being said, it is my pleasure to give the floor to Kani, our brother, to tell us what he intends to do regarding this issue. I urge him to tell us what he intends for the lands, especially upon his uncle's heavenly voyage. Kani, the floor is all yours, brother. Without hesitating, Kani took the floor and started making his case. People of Atejville, the reason why bats fly in the wild skies while holding their heads down is that they have always refused to be referred to as birds. Bats are not birds. In other words, my staying away from the village for over 40 years does not mean that I'm okay with the majority of you thinking I am an outsider, which I will never be. Besides, one of our wise elders had so eloquently asserted something along the lines of a shrub would never become a crocodile for staying under deep water even for centuries to come. I'm firmly standing here today, therefore, to say that I reject the idea of the leadership wanting to dispossess my family from our ancestral lands. While still speaking, Kenny, who visibly was unhappy with the whole situation, reminded the townspeople that his ancestors were among the first people to put roots down in Atejville. He contended no one had the right to dispossess his family from their ancestral lands on the premise that he had left the village for over 40 years. His ancestral lands were associated with a family history made up of values, morals, and beliefs that could not unilaterally be wiped out just to satisfy egos. Um, reading chapter one, Kani, I'm going to read a portion of uh, this chapter. By the time Kani was born, his father was already in his late 50s. He was suffering from some sort of sickness that prevented him from properly providing for his beloved family. Kenny's mother, who was a very nice, self-spoken lady, religiously devoted her life to helping her ailing husband to take care of the family. Of all her children, Kenny was her favorite. One of the reasons was that she had had a complicated pregnancy and, with an amazing do-or-die mentality, painfully remained pregnant for 13 unexplainable months. Out of some unforeseen miracle, she successfully went through with the pregnancy. During labor, which occurred on the third day of the weekday at around 3.30 in the morning, she went through unparalleled complications. 
the 13 brave old women who delivered a son had to perform a c-section the surgical operation of delivering a child by cutting through the wall of the mother's abdomen these courageous old women certainly did not know that what they successfully performed was called a c-section because they had never undergone any type of medical training nor did they hold medical degrees somehow however they knew how to deliver babies even though not far from a Tedgeville in 1926 dr james barry had already performed a c-section in south africa it is also well established that weird phenomenon occurred on the eve of the delivery all over the village and old creepy hoots were heard all night long which was unusual strangely enough the next morning on the day of the delivery around the house Kenny would be born in mysterious and human footprint were present in the wet sand no one could tell their starting or ending point after Kenny's birth his mother suffered from serious pain she almost lost her life due to constant bleeding the bleeding eventually stopped and down the road she fully recovered from the pain caused by the c-section because she went through that painful ordeal that she qualified as hell kenny's mother loved him unconditionally she figured her son's existence must have some kind of spiritual meaning god might have made her go through that horrific experience because her son had a very distinctive purpose to accomplish here on earth the idea of a distinctive purpose to be accomplished by Kenny was even more expanded on by one of the 13 old women who helped with the delivery. The unidentified old lady predicted that one day the baby would become a great person who would accomplish great things for the community. But if the baby himself would not realize those great things, his sons, grandsons or other members of his immediate family would undoubtedly carry those great things through the same old lady also underscored that the baby had amazing capacities she said he had greatness within him she had seen something in the baby's indicative of spiritual powers oddly enough rumor had it that after the delivery the unidentified old lady mysteriously vanished and nobody, nobody heard from her or saw her again.